This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. I'm very happy to welcome you on this day, those of you gathered in this house, those of us who are joining us, Christ Journey Online from your house. Would love to welcome you back here and give you a hug the next time you decide to come on back. Easter's only two weeks away now, so looking forward to sharing that day with you as well. But the scripture today, don't be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. This is a reason why we have reason to rejoice, even with a series as challenging as the one that we're entering into. There is a saying in Spanish, donde el diablo puso la mano, queda huela para rato. Where the devil puts the hand, there's a print for a while. I have some of those prints in my life. I have some of those prints in my soul. I have some of those prints in my past. Maybe you do too. Because when you give him a chance, he leaves a print sometimes a scar. I've seen him in my ministry, too, through the years. Not, not from some cartoon figure that's wearing red tights and carrying a pitchfork and has horns. Much more stealth and, uh, and sinister than that. Far more dark and underhanded and uh, ironic, but posing many times as the one with moral superiority. And I've also felt freedom. I mean, freedom from Jesus. I've shared freedom from Jesus as he announced in his inaugural kingdom of God address, Luke chapter 4. Here's what he said. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. Spirit of almighty God flowing over in me. And he has anointed me. That means Christed, Jesus Christ, the one full of God's spirit. Why? To proclaim good news to the poor. Send me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, and uh, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That means God's grace is being showered out the year of Jubilee. Jesus claims in his inaugural kingdom speech, you just heard a line, that he is here to free the imprisoned and the oppressed, those who, whose lives have marks of where the devil left his print. That's what this is talking about. Some people today write off demons and the devil as the stuff of make-believe and superstition. Jesus, we'll get to what Jesus says in a moment. M. Scott Peck, renowned American psychiatrist, best-selling author of The Road Less Traveled, after extensive experience in his medical practice said this, I know Satan is real. I have met him. And uh, then he wrote not only The Road Less Traveled, but he wrote uh, some books about it, The People of the Lie, Glimpses of the Devil, A Psychiatrist's Personal Accounts of Exorcism, Possession, and Redemption. And he said that he wrote those to try to open closed minds about the reality of Satan. Now, in Miami, with our experience and uh, history of Santaria and voodoo from the islands. We don't need too much convincing sometimes. But the series we begin today that's going to culminate on Resurrection Sunday, Easter Sunday, in the message the devil never saw it coming, is going to focus on the New Testament's plain teaching. The devil, the Son of God, came for this purpose. Why? The Son of God came for this purpose, and it was to destroy the devil's work. So what we're going to do today is start unmasking the shadow where he likes to hide and by asking this question, who the devil is he? Not a whole lot of people talking about him, Um, and though this message is certainly not going to slake every curiosity question you've got, we want to see beyond the veil of our material eyes and into what does the Bible teach in answering this question? Who the devil is he? First question, where did he come from? 
Where did he come from? When we enter the Garden of Eden in the book of Genesis, we discover that a serpent tempter is already there. Before Adam and Eve, seems so. That something has happened in the story before humans came on the scene. And the Bible prophets speak of this. Jesus, in fact, says, Luke chapter 10, verse 18, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. So Satan has fallen in Jesus' perspective. And, um, and the scripture teaches not only did he fall, but Jesus in the model prayer told us that let's pray to be delivered from temptation and from the evil one. Deliver us from the evil one. Evil one, uh, the evil one didn't begin that way. The Bible says he became that way. He started as a beautiful one, a powerful one, an intelligent one, a, uh, an angelic one. So in an oracle from prophet Isaiah, chapter 14, verse 12, he says, how you have fallen from heaven, O morning star. That means shining one. It's translated Lucifer, shining one, morning star. Uh, Because Lucifer, because the the, uh, Latin, lux, is light and fur is bearing. So the one bearing light, Lucifer, the one bearing. How you have fallen, O morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the nations. Then prophet Ezekiel, he speaks this word from the Lord. You were the model of perfection. You were full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were anointed as a guardian cherub, for so I ordained you, God is speaking. You were on the holy mount of God. You walked among the fiery storms. Stones, this is mysterious territory. Verse 15, you were blameless in your ways. Something started really right here. So the prophets are painting a picture of an angelic being that's towering in beauty and in in illumination with power and access to the very presence of God. But at the same time, he's not co-equal with God. Scripture never says, you know, well, there's God and there's the devil, and then, you know, they fight it out. No. No. God is creator, there is one most high and holy God, and one of his creations was Lucifer, a high angel. So he's not co-equal with God, he is not omnipresent, he is not omniscient, he is not omnipotent. He's on par perhaps with other high angels, like Michael, the spiritual warrior who in Revelation chapter 12, in that vision, he does battle with Satan and he casts him out of heaven. Why? Well, because he led a revolt against God. Why? Well, the prophets say it was narcissism. It was hubris. It was uh, pride, envy. He was so taken with himself and with his own greatness, with his beauty, with his splendor, with his power, that he, he deceived himself. And uh, self-deceived, instead of receiving these good gifts of Almighty God as treasures to be stewarded, um, as grace gifts, he just started being enamored with himself over his beauty and intelligence and power and access. And he got self-infatuated. Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 17 says, you, "Your heart became proud on account of your beauty." You corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. You got, in other words, you got so full of yourself that everything became all about you. Isaiah 14, 13, you said in your heart, I will ascend, I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of the assembly, on the utmost heights of the sacred mountain. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. Instead of humbly receiving that he was a made creation by the Most High, I will make myself what I want. And so what we see is a picture of how self-awareness gave way to self-absorption and then turned into self-worship.
The scripture then tells that in his privilege and power, the high angel compels about a third of the other created angels to join the rebellion with him. And in the invisible realm, verse in Revelation chapter 12, the vision there says that the forces of the archangel Michael, the strong warrior angel leading the forces, overcome Lucifer's and they are cast down to the earth. We're just pulling the veil back on what the Bible says. Where did he come from, right? And, uh, and then verse, chapter 12, verse 9, the great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He, he was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. So here's the story. The Bible says he's a created spirit being, Beautiful, powerful, angelic being with free will and moral capacity that's accountable, but on a parallel par with Michael, the great archangel. Not with God, but with Michael. He's powerfully gifted, but he's still accountable to be a servant of God. Now hit the pause button just for a second there, and let's just make a note. Um, Did you know the Bible says that human beings, male and female, are created in the image of Almighty God, but it never says that about angels. Did you know that? Angels are supernatural spirit beings, invisible to the naked eye, created to serve God. And Satan, as a high angel spirit being, um, God made him. But God didn't make him evil. The the Bible story says that Lucifer did that. In his pride of his brilliance and his beauty and his capacity, he felt entitled to more of what he wanted. I will make myself like the Most High. And then he led a rebellion. He found welcome for that message among a third of the angels. And... um, So in essence, here's the picture. God made a good world cosmos. We get to the end of Genesis 1, Genesis 2. God looked at all that he'd made and he said, it's good. It's all good. And and so God didn't make evil. He made good. And in this good world cosmos, this is a world that is free where good choices can be freely made in love or not. You know, the tree in the garden wasn't about the fruit. It was about having the choice to disobey. He wasn't forcing people. He was allowing free people to freely choose to say amen or not. And then we discover that when free choice is abused, that's when evil results. So God didn't create a world that had evil in it, but he created a world that was free where choosing not to go with God's will would bring you the result, evil. Next question, what's he like? Well, the the use of the word he, I could, I'll use the word he, but the Bible, and the Bible uses the word he, but not because angels have gender. He is not a male. Jesus told us that angels are not male or female. They're not like us. Being made human in, as male and female human beings are, are reflecting the image of God. Being made male and female is part of being human, according to the Bible, image bearers of God. But angels are not. Angels are non-material beings, they're spirit beings, they're not male, they're not female, they're invisible to the natural eye, but they're very real. They operate in personal, relational ways and embattle the mind. So when the scripture speaks about mind, that's where spirit encounters happen in your mind. You are able to think spiritually. Jesus taught, and then we find throughout scripture that the devil is an expression of personal evil. So when we encounter evil or Satan or the demonic, it is not as an impersonal force or impersonal fate or a biological deficiency. The Bible's view is that evil is personal. 
Now, don't rush to the conclusion that that means that every negative thing that happens to you comes from the devil. We don't want to give him that much credit because he's not everywhere. But in the Old Testament, where we're first introduced to him, we see that he's the adversary of God's people. In, uh, he set himself in opposition. He is a slanderer who smears reputations. In Job, he's the accuser of humans who wants to find them out. And even if they're doing right, he says, well, they won't if you do this. And then he afflicts people through destructive circumstance, but always and only within the limits that God has allowed to happen. And so as the original sinner, Jesus says he's the original sinner. He murdered from the beginning. He's lied from the beginning. It is his native tongue. Jesus said that the devil is a thief who comes to steal and to kill and to destroy. In the Bible, names define character. So my name is William. It means protector. I'm in my best character when I serve in a protector role, according to my name. In the Bible, names define character. Devil means diabolos. It's a combination of two Greek words, down talker. He's the one who uses words to put people down. In other words, he's full of blame, he's full of shame, and he wants to put you down. That's what devil means. Satan means adversary. He is, set him, he is the adversary of God and people. Evil one means that he's wicked and um, kind of corrosive, like uh, malicious corrosion that can corrupt. He's a deceiver, which means that you gotta watch where his hands are going because there's a lot of sleight of hand going on. You can't trust what you see. There's a veil. You, you, he's a deceiver. He's the king of demons. He's the prince of this world. Jesus said that. We'll talk about that next week. He's the ruler of this world. A usurper who deceived Adam and Eve, hijacked this wonderful gift of the world that had been given to them in trust, and uh, they'd been given it by God, and then showed himself to be a ravenous predator. So verses like, he is a roaring lion, or a wolf in sheep clothes, means that he is hungry to consume. That's the the Bible picture. Seeking to devour. And then we're assured God has him on a leash, and Jesus tells us, we'll get to that in just a moment, but Satan has taken on the spoiler role in this world. That he is defeated, but he's still able to do damage. And God has chosen in his omniscient wisdom, this is the Bible story, to use, to allow Satan's hateful spite and his corruption as an opportunity for God's image bearers, redeemed, empowered, covered by the blood, empowered by the spirit, to learn how to overcome evil and not be overcome by it by dealing with the real thing. It's like a live action training ground so that we can rise to become overcomers and then are equipped to reign with Jesus in eternity. So, you know, God's intention for you isn't just to get you into heaven when you die. God's intention is to raise you up while you're here, overcoming evil in the midst of this a deceiving, treacherous liar, uh, so that you then can become an overcomer that will reign with Christ eternally, actually sharing his throne. And this is, uh, I, this is so ironic. No wonder the devil hates us because he wanted that throne. And he rebelled against God to get it. And yet God created you human being, male, female, image bearers of the Almighty. Why? To rise up, learn to overcome, and actually be the bride of Christ that shares the throne of God with him. Did you know that? Maybe you know this verse. Revelation 3.20 says, look, I'm standing at the door and knock, and if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come in. You know that verse. Did you know the verse that comes right after it? This one. This one. You don't just let him in. He says, and now as you learn how to overcome to the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me 
on my throne. Just as I sat down with my father on his throne. That Jesus wants us reigning with him eternally. And I'm thinking, you know, Revelation says that because of this, the devil's furious. And he knows his time is short. Revelation 12, 12, woe to the earth and the sea because the devil has gone down to you. He's filled with fury because he knows his time is short. He's like a terrorist on assignment looking for a way to do damage. It's like he's standing outside of the church so that when the bride comes out, he can pour acid on her face. He's a hater and a spoiler, and he's seeking to do damage. How does he work? Well, he perverts God's word. This is why it's so significantly important to know what the scripture says for yourself because he's famous for twisting it. He misrepresents truth and takes it out of context so that you are misled to another conclusion than what the scripture says. This is what he tried to do with Jesus. It's what he did with Eve. It's what he does with me. It's what he does with you. It's what he does. So he perverts God's word, and then he twists your thoughts. That's the battlefield is in your mind. That's where the spirit life of this invisible reality truth takes place. And, um, and then he plants doubts and suspicions, casts aspersions on God's character. It's what he did with Adam and Eve. It's what he still does. You know, he said, you know, God's holding out on you. That's why you're not happy. It, it, God, God's making you a victim. Why is he making you wait so long? What's he doing? Did you see what he let me do to Job? Guess what I'm going to do to you? And he's letting it happen. How can you trust God like that? You, you can't trust him. Why would he create something for you to want and then not let you have it? See what happens? How cruel. You can't trust him. And then the scripture says that Satan masquerades as an angel of light. 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen. 14. What does that mean? That he loves to perch on high moral ground. He disguises his deceit um, and treachery with moral superiority. How does he do that? Well, his temptations usually comes with thoughts like this. That's not fair. That's not right. Who thought of that? Whose idea was that? You know, that you, you know better. Yeah, that's why you've been thinking about that. Just do it your way. Makes a whole lot more sense. And the thing is that he, he wraps his lie in half-truths that feel all true. Right? And, uh, but it, it's, like, it's actually like bait on a hook, and you don't get to see the hook. You just see the bait. Looks like the real thing, moves like the real thing, smells like the real thing, you know? You bite down on it, what's the first thing you know? It's not real. And now it's pulling back. Satan uses vice grips, vice grips with human beings to get them trapped, addictions that take people captive and they can't get out. And something else, this is why Jesus said, you know, I came because I'm, I'm going to free people up. I'm going to open people's eyes. They can't see what they can't see. And that's one of the reasons why you don't see what you don't see, because you don't see what you don't see. And Jesus said, I come to turn the lights on so you'll see what you haven't been seeing. That's what this is about. He says, I'm going to set you free so that all these lies that have been taking you captive and that have been holding you prisoner, he, he's going to come in and set us free. But here's something else the devil knows. The devil knows that most of us don't wake up in the morning and say, I wonder what I could do that's really wicked today. We don't get up in the morning and say, I think I'll go do something immoral. I just feel like this is the day to break every law of God. You know, we don't do that. We don't wake up that way. But what he also knows is we rationalize real well. (laughs) We can be tricked into doing something wrong if we believe it's for the right reason. 
for a reason that's right enough. So we say the ends justifies the means. I mean, you say, well, it's not that wrong when you do it for a reason like that. You know, this, we tell ourselves rational lies. And the scripture says that the devil sets traps like that and that he blindsides us, you don't see him coming, and that he mugs you sometimes like a thug in an alley to take you down and hurt you. And then he takes the very good thing that God made. God didn't make evil, he made a good world. Satan is not a creator. He's a, he's a thief, and then he takes God's good gifts and twists them into be used in bad ways that result in ugly consequences. This is his technique. At least this is what the Bible says anyway. See, nothing is truly good without the God that made it. God made a good world and wanted to share every good day with his new creation, And Satan's goal was to get those image bearers trying to live their lives without their good God. He's still doing it. To hurt God by hurting his image bearers. You want to hurt a parent, hurt their child. This is his goal, the ones he loves, to keep us from the saving power of the good news of Jesus Christ by telling us you can't trust God, you got better ideas than him, you know how your life should be going. This sounds very much like what the prophet said, oh, this is how it all began. The truth is the devil can't make you do anything, but what he can do is deceive you, mislead you, misrepresent, and then misdirect you so that you think you're being free, making all these choices, and the next thing you know, the stranglehold is closing in on your throat. He can deceive you, he can misuse, he can mislead you to abuse your free will. But it's your will, it's your choice. But he will seek to mislead you to misuse your free will the same way he did. The same way he did. Why? Because now you're being taken outside of God's will and slyly being stolen away to have your life willed by the one who started it all and said, I got a better plan. That's why Jesus taught us to pray, your kingdom come, you be my sovereign, Lord. Your kingdom in my life, your will be done. I don't want to miss any of it. I want to be right in the fat middle of the blessing of God every day of my life, and the devil is going to be there to lie to me about him, to lie to me about the temptation, to then smear my reputation and take me down and take me out of circulation. And Jesus is saying, man, every day, fix your eyes on me, pray like this, your will be done in my life so that we don't miss the opportunity. So how are we to respond? How are we to respond? Martin Luther in the Reformation wrote this amazing hymn, Mighty Fortress is Our God. It says, our ancient foe still seeks to work us woe. His craft and power are great and armed with cruel hate and on earth is not his equal. Did we in our own strength confide our battle would be losing? We're not the right man on our side, the man of God's own choosing. You ask who that may be. Christ Jesus, it's he. How are we to respond to this supernatural spirit evil in Jesus Christ? (laughs) The one who came to destroy the works of the devil. More about that in the two weeks to come. But we we find and follow Jesus. That's the way to freedom. We experience his forgiveness washing over our sin, cleansing us from guilt, washing us from shame so we're not chained up by the smear tactics. He said, I came to set you free so that the shackles of sin drop as we step into becoming overcomers. Our tomorrows don't have to look like our yesterdays. We're not stuck in the same habits that have held us to this point. This is why Jesus told his disciples. I mean, he's going to come to live inside us. His victory becomes ours. And he said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I was there, guys, and I watched the mutiny attempt fail. But I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions, 
You know, they still bite, they still sting. The, the bullets are real in this battle. But you can trample on them and you will overcome all the power of the enemy and nothing will harm you. This is God's goal, to raise up overcomers by fighting real battles so that we can share his throne as eternal partners with him. That's a mind blower. More about that in the weeks to come. But here's the summary for today. According to Jesus, the devil is real. The devil is real. He's a, he is a hater of humanity. You think you know hate speech? Learn it from him. He, uh, he's your spiritual adversary. We don't deny his presence, but neither do we obsess in distraction. We follow Jesus. This is the way forward. Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. We walk in Jesus' victory. We war from Jesus' victory. We use the armor of Jesus' weaponry, his way. We use it his way, not the way of the world, and that's where the victory is. And as a result, we demolish strongholds, Paul says, by bringing every thought captive, the way we think, the way we speak, under the Spirit of God, guided by his truth that sets people free. And so we get to the end of 1 John's letter, or John's letter, 1 John 5, and he says, this is the victory. He's writing to people like us. He says, this is the victory that overcomes the world. It's your faith. It's not your bank account. It's not your education. It's not your pedigree. It's not your muscle. It's not your brain. It is your faith, your choice to receive and trust Jesus, the stronger than the strong man, which is where we're going to pick it up next week. Would you bow with me? Gracious God, we pray that your word will not return void, that it will accomplish everything that you desire for each person individually that has heard it. We ask, Holy Spirit, that you give us insight and illumination. Lord Jesus, that you turn on the lights and help us see through the deceit, the fog of war, the battle fatigue, that has come to some because they've been fighting faithfully and fighting well. Somebody is feeling like they don't know if they can hold out. And I pray right now, Holy Spirit, that you would strengthen once again their legs, cause them to stand up straight, give their backbone fire and strength from on high. And Lord, for those that are fatigued, and feel like nothing is changing, we, we pray that they would hear your call to come to cast every care upon you, to lay down their burden, and to let you give them rest for their soul. We thank you for warriors who have been at this battle for years and years, and once again have suited up and we ask your encouraging inspiration, your anointing upon them. We pray especially for our young people as they venture out on mission, that you would protect them, that you would provide for them, that you would guide them in righteousness sake. We pray that you would set people free today in the forgiveness of sins and the presence of your spirit. Maybe you've realized, friend, that that you really haven't experienced Jesus as liberator in this way. And this is the moment to invite him to forgive your sins and to come into your life and then to trust him for brighter days ahead. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you in your warrior perfection for laying your life down in my place. Thank you for rising from the dead so that now your spirit can come alive in me. Forgive me, cleanse me, fill me, and now lead me so that I might grow to be the overcomer you would have me be. And thank you, Lord, for the amazing vision of sharing eternity with you in your name. Now, if you just prayed with me to trust Christ as your Savior and would let me Ask God's blessing upon your next steps of faith. I'm gonna invite you simply to raise your hand. Our heads are bowed, just raise your hand. If you're joining us online, just click it into the chat. And uh, 
and let me have just a moment. Thank you. God bless you. Toward the back on my left. Amen. Amen. Thank you. And here in the middle, thank you toward the back. God bless you. Sir, I'm seeing you right here in the middle toward the right and up here toward the front. Thank you, sister. God bless you. Right here in the front. Amen. Amen. Toward the back. Thank you, sir, on my right. Lord Jesus, for every person who by lifting their hand is saying, my heart is open and I'm taking a step of faith to trust you as my liberator, my forgiver, and then to lead me to become an overcomer. We pray today that they will hear your spirit say, greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Would you grant them, Holy Spirit, a sense of your peace, a sense of your presence, and Lord Jesus, the fullness of grace so that their year of jubilee, a year of your favor, can begin even now. We make this prayer in your name. Amen.